want to just say something about what's going on in, in our world. Um, we are seeing, like back at my home church, we have just, are just seeing some really um, amazing things that God is doing and the hunger of the people of God. And we are watching, even in our church, um, just the hunger is raising in our church. And, um, and we're just believing God that God just continues to sweep through our nation and, our, and we believe in God for our uh, just true revival would hit our country. True revival, you know what, I heard somebody say this one time. He said, when, um, if you're praying for revival, draw a circle on the ground and pray that God hits revival in that circle and then you jump in that circle. So start with me, amen? Start with the hunger in me. And, um, and I believe that there's just such a thing going on in, in, in our country. It's not gonna look the same for everybody. We're not copycatting anybody, amen? But it's, it's, we're just believing God that God is gonna move in the hearts of his church first to go out and, and do what God's called us to do, amen? Can you all believe that with me? I believe that here in Vertical Church. I'm so excited about you. You guys are moving into a new building. But also, I'm also excited about what's gonna be building and moving into you. The new pressure, the new passion and presence of God in you as you move into a new building, what God's gonna move in you, amen? Can we just believe that? So I'm going to read a scripture, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to go where God wants us to go. Let's start. We're going to John 15 and verse 1. Jesus speaking. It's a lengthy scripture, so hold tight. It says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit, that it will produce more fruit. Everybody say more fruit. I'll say it like you mean it, church. More fruit. Amen. There we go. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Everybody say much fruit. Because you can do nothing, everybody say nothing, without me. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown aside like a branch and he withers. They gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My, fo- my, f- excuse me, my father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit. Everybody say much fruit. And you, produce, and you prove to be my disciples. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this place. We have worshiped you this morning. Jesus, we've honored you. Holy Spirit, we've welcomed you. God, I pray, Father, that you would just do a work in our hearts this morning. God, I pray, God, that you would Move on our hearts in a new way. God, I'm, I know I'm new in this pulpit, but God, Holy Spirit, you're not new here. And Holy Spirit, we ask, we welcome your voice. Put your hand on your heart right where you're at. Come on, come on. I, you know, I'm, let me just be honest. I didn't drive an hour and 30 minutes just to pat you on the head with a little message. I, I believe God gave me a word, and you are here for such a time as this. So Holy Spirit, do exactly what you wanna do in me this morning, through us. And God, I pray, Holy Spirit, speak to every heart in this room and those watching. We thank you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. 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 So a little bit of background on this scripture. This is a really interesting time in Jesus' ministry when he talks about this. This is actually, a lot of people, theologians will call this the farewell. Um, address. Um, this is Jesus. This is actually a really cool time because it's, it's between the time of the Last Supper and the betrayal of Judas. So this is a short time in, um, in, the, in this moment, but it's given in scriptures this four chapters worth of, 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 uh, of material that Jesus actually speaks. So it's amazing that in this real, real short window of time, that Jesus is like, um, he's got some things he wants to tell. How many of you are parents and you have taught teenagers how to drive? Where are my, where are my hands? You've taught teenagers how to drive. 
I am with you. I feel it, right? So we had, um, we had two, um, we had, we have, I have two children, my kids of my own. Um, they, um, they're not children anymore. One's married, one's in Bible school. But um, they, um, we taught them how to drive. And we had actually two other people that actually lived with us, and we taught them how to drive. And it's terrifying. So you do all the things. You set up the cones, right? You, you've done all the work to, sit up, to set up the cones, to, to teach them how to parallel park. Like, why? Why do we teach our kids still how to parallel park? I have no idea. Especially, like, in Blairsville. Like, there's, when is there ever the opportunity where you're going to need to know how to parallel park, right? Like, so, but we teach them, and we do all this stuff. We teach them how to be defensive drivers and don't, not too fast. And, you know, we've, I've been through it where, you know, one of our, one of the people that stayed with us, like, would just, like, forget there was a thing of stop signs and literally just drive right through them. And it's terrifying. Amen? It's terrifying. Like, that's why you teach them. And then there's that moment when they're 16, they get their license or however, whatever age you allowed your kids to, um, to drive. There's that time where they're going to go on their own and they're going to, you're going to give them the keys and you're, they're going to go to Walmart, their friends, wherever they go. I don't know why Walmart is like the number one thing for people. They were, that's the way it was with us. I'm going to go to Walmart and buy this pack of gum, but I'm going to drive to get, right? So, it's, it's this moment where you're like, you have the keys in your hand, and you're like, wait, but one more thing before you get in the car. This is Jesus' one more thing before I hand you the keys. This is Jesus' moment where he's like, he goes, I got one more thing I need to tell you before I hand you over the keys, and, and, I'm, and, and you're, because you're going to have to do, you're going to have to take this beyond me, and you're going to have to take this message and take the kingdom work after I'm gone. So before I give you the keys, I got one more thing I want to tell you. This portion of scripture is the one more thing. And, um, and really he talks about a lot in this, uh, this, these, these chapters. And Philip, I know Philip has been teaching on the Holy Spirit a lot lately. And really it all revolves around the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of believers. Like, you'll do nothing except through the power of the Holy Spirit, right? So, so these are the, he's like, before you go, don't do this on your own. Just hear me out. And then he gives this amazing um, example of this idea of these vines and the branches. And he says to us, he says, by you growing fruit, they'll know you're my disciples, this idea of fruit is not a side issue with Jesus. It's not an optional idea with Jesus. Jesus is like, this is the main thing. I've called you to bear fruit. To bear fruit. And, and, uh, and they'll know you by your fruit that you bear. And so I think it's really important that we understand what is fruit. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus, and he says this, For you were once darkness, but now you are light, light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth, testing what is pleasing to the Lord. Don't participate in fruitless works of darkness, but instead expose them. So Jesus, I mean, uh, Paul is saying, like, there's, um, there's this another idea of this fruit. And he actually talks uh, in Galatians a little bit more. I, I guess that's, I was watching one of uh, Philip's messages over the last couple of weeks. Like, that's one of his favorite, like, Philip is like all Old Testament in the book of Galatians. Like, he is, that's, that's Philip, right? And I love it. But this idea of fruit is, um, let me back up. Let me just say this. There's a word in our Christian, you know, we have Christianese. We speak Christian things, and people outside the church are like, and if you're new to the faith, you're like, I don't even know what, like, the, like righteousness. That means something, and it's significant. I'm not really sure I wrap my whole mind around what that means, but it's important. There's a word sanctification. I kind of know what that all means. There's another word that's used, and that word is glory. Everybody say glory. glory. Say like an old Baptist, say glory. 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 
How many of y'all had that person in your church growing up or wherever, and, and that was their, they, were, they, didn't, they weren't amen, they were glory, right? There's, there's, so this word, but it has meaning. It, this word glory has substance to it. It means something. And so actually what this word glory, it has to do with this idea of something that is revealed or it's like the reality of what that thing is, right? The glory, um, so we talk about the glory of God. But also just in the natural, let's just talk about the natural. Where's my Braves fans at? We got Braves fans in the house, amen? Um, As we always say in Braves country, this is our year. This is totally our year. As every Atlanta sports fan says, and always disappointment, hey, this is our year, right? Full of faith. There's no greater faith people than Atlanta sports fans. Amen. Right? So, so, um, so there's this guy, the greatest home run hitter in the history is Hank Aaron. You can't argue it with me. It is what it is. He did it without any help. <laughs> and so when Hank Aaron would get up to bat and he would hit those home runs, what was in him was in display by what he did. What was in him to produce those home runs, I don't know. I I could never, ever do what Hank Aaron did. Can't even, like, hit a small round ball with a small round bat that's going about 90 miles, 95 miles an hour at you, right? To hit those over the fence, that his talent was on display. You could say his glory was on display when he hit those home runs, right? Take a, take a, a singer. Take a singer. Like, you take, like an Adele, right, or Whitney Houston, right, a Celine Dion. Man, when they, when they belt those last notes and, man, they, they pour out everything and all of a sudden, like, just, you just go, you're just amazed. You're in awe of what they're doing. You can say that really that's the glory of what's inside them is becoming reality, right? So when we talk about God's glory, It's the reality of who he is displayed. Scripture says this, that the heavens and all of creation displays the glory of God. Driving up here down from Woodstock, you know, you just can't help. Man, I'm so jealous of you guys living in this, all this beauty up here. It's just amazing. There's one section of 575 as I'm coming up over the hill. And all of us, it's the first time you see the, the mountains of North Georgia. It's gorgeous. It gets me every single time. And I'm sitting, glory. It is the glory of God. I look at it and go, that's amazing. What hands could have created that but God? The beauty of God. Not only that nature, just in all of its nature. You ever look at like um, uh, like a little groundhog? Like you see the, no, the little prairie dogs? Like that you see on the, I'm a nature buff. You watch these little ground, they're so cute. They're so scurrying around. They're like, a, like, what does that say about who, like, God made that? That was his idea. The dolphins that, like, jump in the seas and, and all this stuff, and they're just, like, they always seem happy. They always seem, like, what does that say about our God? His glory is displayed in his creation. But also, his glory and his character is on display by his character and his, his nature of who he is. Right? So, Simply put, um, it's not going to be on the screen, but just this this very familiar scripture. When Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, he says they're joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Right? And he says these things are fruit of the Spirit. That means it is is like the, um, it is who God is. You could say, going back to this example of the vine and the branches, you know what, you don't know, like you look at an apple tree. Some of you may, I don't. You, when you look at an apple tree, well, maybe just like it is apple country, like up here. But I can't look at a tree and say that's an apple tree or an orange tree. I can't tell the difference. I can't look at a vine and tell that's a muscadine vine or that's a grape vine. But I do know it when, when I see its fruit. You could say that that fruit is the glory of, of that vine. You could say that that fruit is the glory of that tree. Because the DNA of that tree, 
of that, excuse me, of that fruit is found in the trunk and in, the, in everything inside of that tree. And everything that is, is in that tree will come out, and it, we know these things, right? Apple trees don't produce oranges, right? Muscadine vines don't, the, the, the whole thing as it goes on. Because whatever's in that tree is gonna come out in the form of fruit, if it's a fruit tree or a vine. It's the same with us. God wants to produce himself, his DNA within us, because why? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. See, too many of us, we live our lives, we try to do all the right things. I wanna work up my kindness today. My boss is a jerk. Oh, Lord, I mean, I'm gonna have to muscle it through. That is not the picture of what Jesus is describing. It's describing this idea that if you're connected to the vine, this is what kind of fruit you're gonna produce. It's more automatic than what we would, we would think. But that's good news, because it's not up to me. What's up to me is to be connected to the vine. See, let's be very clear. The power to live this life, this Christian life, is not in natural means. This has always been a supernatural gospel with supernatural ability. And not just the, ooh, the gifts and all that. No, to walk in the fruit of the Spirit, to show extraordinary kindness to people who don't, quote unquote, deserve it, to show love and be, be, uh, be compassionate. Do you, do you know, like, what I'm seeing like a lot in the world is there, be careful like um, that uh, we're gonna mess. I, this is my third time here, so like, like in our house, if, like, you, if you spend the night, you're kind of like family. So I feel like we're like just family. So, um, so what, what I'm seeing a lot of is like, we're mad at a lot of things that are going on in the world and should be. Be careful that we're not mad at the people Understand that the people are just people that are victims of an enemy's ploy to destroy their lives. Be careful that when we see those things that we see and those displays of ungodliness, that we have the ability to see as Jesus would, to see the human that God loves in those people. But that only happens by the work of the Holy Spirit. Because in natural, well, if you think like I do, some of the things that I think, right? Right? So how do we actually, so what is, what is the process, right? What is the way that we're going to walk in this revelation or where, what's the way that we're gonna walk in this, um, in this idea of living a life that produces fruit? Jesus says this, and, and I, I would ask you if we really believe it. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Some of you may say, man, I, I really, honestly, if you're honest, I, the only thing I thought about God was I was going to his place today, and I was going to hear his message. But you know what? I didn't think about God when I was, like, brushing my teeth. I didn't really think and pray, God, would you help me brush my teeth? Right? There's a lot of things we do, like ungodly people, people outside the faith brush their teeth. You know what I'm saying? And I know, I know, God, in, in God, uh, there's no power outside of God, and there's only life inside of God. All of our, I get it, I get it, I get it. But the thing of what I'm saying is, what Jesus is saying, he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. What does he mean by nothing? I mean, like, I, I can't get up, I can't drive my car, I can't, what does he mean? What he's saying is, apart from me, you will do nothing of, sub, of uh of substance for the kingdom without apart from him, apart from him. So what we have, this, and uh, so, and let me, just, let me say this. What we've reduced Christianity down to, unfortunately, is a bunch of rules of don'ts. Yeah, there's works of the flesh. We're supposed to stay away from the works of the flesh, right? But should that be our number one goal, that I don't do these things? Hey, I didn't have less problem this week. Awesome. 
hey, I had an opportunity to be rude. I, I, wasn't, I, didn't, I didn't do rudeness today, this week. That's, that's become modern Christianity. It's stop doing all the bad stuff. That is not the focus of what Jesus is speaking here in this passage. That is not the focus of even what Paul says and when he writes in Galatians about the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit, right? This, it's this idea. So I would, I would hope that this morning we would have a mindset shift that we say, okay, uh, yes, 100%, like m- all the works of the flesh, we're not supposed to do those things, right? But what if Vertical Church, my home church, Hope Church, we made a radical shift to say, I'm not only going to, like, yes, I'm not going to do those works of flesh, but my focus is, God, fill me with your spirit that I would show forth your glory everywhere I go. I would show forth your glory. Not that I didn't flip somebody off on the road. Not that, and that's good, don't do that. Especially if you have a vertical sticker on the back of your shirt. Amen, Philip, got you. We didn't cuss out our boss. Woo! Like, I feel like God's like, that's like level like one. What I've called you to do is bear fruit. What I've called you to do, Christian, is to what Jesus was like, be like him. You think Jesus walked around going, oh, I'm not going to lust today. How can I help? What can I bless? How can I give of myself? How can I be selfless to other people? How can I live a life that, watch this, that shows people who God is? That's our goal. You and I have been filled with the Holy Spirit, given his presence, the remaking of our hearts, into a new creation in Christ. As Paul would say, it says to go forth and do good works. Not to just go forth and not do bad works. To go forth and do good works. So the question is, what do people see in the church today? Oh yeah, we're gonna disagree about some moral things, 100%. But are they seeing the character and nature of the revealed God in the lives of his followers? Is he seeing God's glory? Remember, the glory is not just some ethereal thing. It's a reality thing. My job is to show forth, hmm, show forth, just God just remind me of that scripture, show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. To show forth who he is. That's our job. So all these fruits of the Spirit should be things that just come out of us. They're things that should flow out of us. And and we can't do it apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't. We can't. I don't know about you. I got too much flesh. I know my wife sometimes, like, when I'm having one of those days, we all have one of those days, right? Husbands, we always have one of those. Wives, we always have... You know, employers, employees, we all have one of those days where my wife will sometime look at me and she goes, uh, uh, you need to go pray. Like, you, you, for real. Like, you are not thinking properly. How many of you are glad you have a spouse like that? They'll look at you, oh, man, these guys are so chicken. Like, how many of y'all glad you have a spouse that will call you out about stuff, right? You need to go pray. You need to go pray. And so, um, yeah. Because apart from him, I can do nothing. Didn't, didn't, didn't the prophet say, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord? He's actually talking to, this, this, um, he's talking to these guys that were after the um, return of the, uh, when they were in um, uh, captivity, right? 
and they were brought out of captivity, and they were building a new temple, and they were like, hey, we're gonna, we want the glory to be good. We want the glory to be amazing. And God speaks to the prophet and says, hey, it's not going to happen by your own strength. It's going to be by the power of God. Like this glory of God, this revealed nature of who God is, is not going to happen in, in vertical church, in hope church, in any church, unless it's the Holy Spirit empowered moving on the hearts of people, people that are close to him. That's what we're called to do. It's time for us to ditch our natural ability and tap in to a supernatural ability in God's Holy Spirit. To tap into his power, to walk the walk that we've been called to walk. Like, like if, if, you don't, if, you, if you don't understand now, you will, that there's a supernatural power needed in this time to come against the supernatural enemy that we face. This is not going to, you are no match for our enemy, period. So, how do we do this? So glad you asked. As Philip would say, point number two. <laughs> you got to have three. And actually, in real messages, you're supposed to have a poem. Three points and a poem. I don't know. I'm like Philip from last week. I don't know how many points I got. So, um, but I do know this is the second point is that you're going to ha- how do you tap in to the power of the holy spirit how do you do that well let me first say the way there are some traps that kind of look like christianity and it looks like we're tapping in and it's not and many of us fall into this trap and one of those things is um, actually I was talking to somebody this earlier is exchanging our self-help books for study outside of scripture well, we see this all the time. We, we, now, those self-help groups are good. Christian self-help, they're, they're great. But think about the words that we're using, self-help books. And yeah, those, I'm so thankful for people that have written all these books, that have gained understanding and knowledge, and gained all this wisdom from their life experience. But, but, and, and you can take some of those things, but let me just say, some of those things, they fit you, and some of them don't. You ever read a book, and they go, yeah, this kind of fits like, you know, like my brother's sweater, right? You know what I'm saying? It didn't really fit me. It kind of does. I use some, kind of some principles. But it will, never, it will never replace your own personal Bible study. It will never replace your own ability to hear from God for yourselves. Thank you. I will. And because, listen, those are, and those are sometimes good. I'm not saying don't read books. If Philip writes a book, read it. I'm sure it's wonderful. Some of your favorite people that you read, read them. But what I'm saying is don't replace that and think that you are reading Scripture. And you're reading because the Word of God is powerful for you. Prayer is powerful for you and your own walk. In your own life. Another thing is this. Boy, this is a big one. I may not be invited after this one. But, or how about this one? Consuming mass amounts of news so that we can be aware of our times. Do we need to be aware of our times? 100%. Most of the time, you don't even have to go read the news. You see it in your lives. Right? It's good to know. It's good to be informed. I'm a believer in that. It's good to vote. It's good to all do all those things. But your mass amounts of news feeding does nothing for your spiritual condition of your own heart. We read, we look, we don't. No wonder, no wonder we have an epidemic of our young people of depression and anxiety. If you don't know what's going on in Gen Z, there's cool revival going, but there's also masses amounts of depression and anxiety in our Gen Z. And our Gen Z need us to be the light, be caring and loving and all those things that we're supposed to be, to show them the way, right? We were never meant to mass amount 
information, actually, actually, I believe, about anything, anything. You're, like, remember the, the, um, the people going across the plains of, the, in the prairie days? They're going, they're going off to find gold in California? Do you think they knew what was going on in Ukraine? Do you think they knew what was going on? They probably didn't know there was a Ukraine. They didn't know there was an Africa. Like, what is, I don't know all about that stuff. I don't know what's going on in Malawi. We consume so much. I believe that we weren't made, as a matter of fact, some sociologists say we were only meant to be in communities of about 200 people. Because we can't handle it. We were never meant to handle all of the, to be able to go, I know everything there is to know about everything in the world at the touch of my hands. Because listen, because here's, here's a something. You weren't called to fix the world. You were called to be a light wherever you go. Did you know that you're calling? How about this? Did you know because you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, because you're called to bear fruit, you know, you know what's amazing? Everywhere you go is where Jesus wants to be. I'll say it again. Everywhere you go is where Jesus wants to be. By the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. So God, what, what do you have for me today? But I'm aware of the times. I'm empty like my car was yesterday, but I know what's going on. I'm not processing it well, but I know what's going on. And how about this? This is, this is um, huh, pun intended, low-hanging fruit to pick on. Is our, our addiction, all of us, to social media? Uh, it's, it's, it's a fact, right? It's a, it's a, it's a thing of our day. And um, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a problem. Scripture says that when we sow to our flesh, we reap of our flesh. We sow the Spirit, we, we reap of the Spirit. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but I, I want you to think about it. I want, to, I want you to word picture something. When you're on your phone and you're scrolling through your TikTok or your, face, or your Instagram reels or whatever you're doing, I want you to think as you're moving your thumb like this, you ever see somebody plant seed? Every time you do the little scroll up, I want you to think that I'm planting seed in here. I'm planting something. Information just doesn't come in and just leave. It, it comes in and affects and does things. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. That didn't go over well. It's the truth. It's so, I want you to think about that. Oh, that guy, that curly-headed guy came up and like, he was talking about like, and whenever you're looking at your TikTok, oh, oh, it's like seed, I'm planting seed, right? There's a better way, and that's what we're gonna move on to. In other words, what I'm trying to say is what Paul says when he says that you can have a form of godliness but deny the power. You can have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. So what do we do? What do we do? It's things that we know. That your power comes in this amazing word called remaining in him. What does that look like? That we can walk in communion with our God all the time. Prayer without ceasing is part of what that looks like. That I'm walking in communion with God. I am attached to the vine. I am getting the sap, if you will, of the Holy Spirit imparted into me all the time, all the time, all the time. That I can walk in a knowledge and a fellowship with the Lord wherever I go. But it comes with communion with God. And then there's times what we need to do is we need to be people that spend time in his word. This is, these are not revelation. You're not gonna, these next two things, you're gonna go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay. Spending time in God's word. Spending time in prayer. Spending time in prayer. Spending time with other believers that encourage you. Like, in, in this hour, I really understand why it says that as the days grow darker, don't forsake 
fellowshipping together. Don't forsake fellowshipping together. Let me just add a little bit that it's more than just sitting in a chair and then leaving. It's fellowshipping, being in community with one another. I pray that this new building creates so much community in this church. Relationships. We have a saying at our church that discipleship, growing in your walk, however you want to say it, happens best in relationships. It happens okay from a pulpit, yep, yep. Happens okay from a podcast, yep, yep. It happens best in relationships, in your relationships. Iron sharpening iron. So I've been reading, at the beginning of the year, I felt like the Lord really impressed me to start reading about the, some of the old revivals that have happened in some of our more recent, more recent history. Um, going back to the Welsh revival, especially. And it was interesting what happened in the Welsh, if you're not familiar with the Welsh revival, it happened in Wales. And it happened because um, a couple of people just, actually, um, uh, this guy prayed for like 13 years for revival. And then all of a sudden, just this hunger for God just started manifesting in the people. And people started coming to these meetings, and, and, um, and, and God started pouring out, and people, there was repentance, true repentance. And then that, like, spread over all through Wales. So much so that the, um, some of the sports arenas and the sports teams, and if you look, actually, if you go and look in some of those, those the sports, um, it would be the ESPN, right, of Wales back in the late, uh, early 1900s, late 1800s. I'm sure they had ESPN. If, um, if you go back and look at some of the, the, um, the soccer teams, it says canceled due to revival. It so impacted the world. It so impacted the, um, that area that businesses shut down. It was like COVID, like better, like, right? It was like better, right? Because everybody was out. And they were out in revival and they were going to churches. The, the arenas were filled with people that were seeking after God. And what was amazing is there wasn't really a leader of that revival. There was the name, there was a name, but really the leader, it was just everybody was just hungry for God. It was God did a supernatural work. And my question as I read these things, my heart started to break. It's like, why not now? God, why not now? And then I don't know if you've seen, but I went in and watched the Jesus Revolution and, and watching the, um, the amazing uh, Chuck Smith welcome the hippies in. And so sometimes I go, God, who are our hippies today? Who are those that we're leaving out because of religious stuff? Because they're there. God, who are we missing? And then I see, like, this Jesus revolution. I mean, we have, we have people here that your life was affected through the Jesus movement. Your kids, maybe your parents were um, affected by the Jesus movement. I, I so feel we're so primed for that. Because it's interesting, in the Jesus movement, what, what the counter was for what the Jesus movement provided was a counter to people outside doing the whole sex, drugs, rock and roll thing. And they were discovering, and what our generation, I believe, is seeing, is we're discovering that that stuff doesn't satisfy anything. Why are our children, why are our Gen Z in depression and anxiety? They're seeing that this stuff doesn't fix anything. So instead of us being mad at them, instead of us being upset and going, those kids these days they need the reality some of the very same things and and things that happen in the Jesus movement I believe can happen now because young young men and women are realizing the emptiness of all that stuff so who will be the church the representatives of Jesus that show forth God's glory to this generation and the people around us. I, I, I've read too much. I've seen too much. If God did it before, why not now? Why not, why not vertical church? You think you're building a building for yourselves? 
You think you're building it so, it'll be, so you don't have to have tarps on the ground? You're building it for the people of Blairsville that are lost. And they say, will somebody represent God to me? Because I believe if we show them who God is, they'll have that opportunity to come to him. It's the fruit of the Spirit. But it only happens through the power and presence of God. And so what we have to ask ourselves is, am I hungry for more of him? So the question I want to ask you, Vertical, here and in Hawassi, is how are we doing? How are we doing? But I got good news. The, the Bible says that God fills all the hungry with good things from his spirit. Jesus says those who are hungry will be filled. So are you hungry for God to do something new? Are you tired of living a life that's, um, you know, I, I sit back and honestly, I was over here and, and I don't remember like the second song because I was, sit, I was just so amazed. I'm sitting here watching uh, David Cho up here um, leading worship. And I remember David Cho from my young adult group. And I'm, like, I'm just like, I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of Kalen who was in our young adult group. You know what I'm also glad? I'm glad that when I was tired, that God's power filled me. I remember, and I remember those times when David Cho would come and talk to me. Hey, Dave, hey, Pastor David, I need to talk to you. And God would, and I would sit back and go, I don't know, what, I don't know how to answer that. But somehow the Holy Spirit would know what to say, and it would speak words into his life and into Kalen's life. I'm so grateful that it wasn't all about me. It was by the work that the Holy Spirit did in and through me. And even today, like there's nothing like watching people that you help lead in some way or another to the goodness of God, to watch them grow up and watch them serve. Like David Chosley, I don't know what, he's, he's all over the place. Every time I see him, he's in a different, different place. Watching Pastor Philip and Kalen pastor this church, I'm just so proud of those guys. I'm a little mad at you guys, too, because he was our youth pastor for a while, and the next thing I know, he's up here. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, I forgive you. I release you. Kaylin was actually our first youth pastor. She ran our youth ministry for a long time. But there, there's something in you that you can make a difference. And maybe you don't have a platform. Maybe you don't have a mic. Maybe you don't have your YouTube channel. Maybe you don't have, but you know what you do have? People that you go and come in contact with every day. Every single day. You are a light everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank God. Aren't you glad it's not all up to you? Aren't you glad your salvation wasn't up to you? Aren't you glad it is not by works that you were saved, by his, but by his grace? It's the same thing for those co-workers. It's the same thing for those, that, that uh, grocery store worker. It's the same thing for the, your, um, your family, right? I'm going to ask the worship team to come on back up. And I want to ask you this one more thing. Two things. One, are you hungry for more? And are you tired? No, okay, three things. And are you tired of trying to do it on your own? This is a speaker's privilege. You get to do that. You make it up as you go. Are you hungry? And you're like, I, I, you're like David, I don't, I don't know what that even looks like for me. Like prayer is really like a foreign deal. I don't even know how to pray or I don't even know what that even looks. Studying my Bible, this just seems so intimidating. I get it. I get it. But let me ask you one thing. What is one new thing? Not 20. Not, I'm not asking you to memorize the book of James. It's not a bad idea. But I'm not asking you to do that. 
What's one thing that you can do that can allow that remaining in him to become that reality for you? Not a million things. What's one thing? Maybe you put some worship music on and you worship God. Maybe you find the playlist from this morning and you go, what's that? Find it on Spotify and you just worship God all alone. Just you and him. Maybe you go, you go to the Psalms and you read, the book of, you read a chapter of Psalms and you don't read it fast so you get done with it. You read it slow so maybe God can speak to you about something that he wants to reveal to you and you sit and meditate in that word. Or maybe you simply, whenever you leave your house, say, hey, I heard this guy say this, Lord. He said, everywhere I go today is where you want me to be. Every, excuse me, everywhere I go is where Jesus, where you want to be. So what do I need to do today? It's that simple. And I'm not asking you to go pass out tracks. I'm not asking you to do the whole four spiritual laws and, you know, get them to, you know, tell them how bad they are so they can get saved. And I'm not, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm just go out and be a light and bear fruit for this generation. And I believe that the glory of God, the revealed nature of who God is, just like that fruit is the revealed glory of the vine. You and I have the ability through the power of the sap in the vine, the power of the Holy Spirit within us to be the revealed glory of who God is. Not by might, not by my own power, but by his spirit. Let's all stand together. What's one thing Bow your heads with me. Lord, what's one thing? What's one thing?